Um, so my name is Michael Walling. Um, I'm an I'm embedded systems contractor. Um, I have my own consultancy called Incordia Embedded Design. Um, I've been doing this for many years and I usually do uh, printed circuit board design and firmware uh, and combination thereof. Um, Today I'm going to talk about uh, Libre Silicon, um, some of the projects that I've worked on in the space, and um, kind of how we got here and uh, where we're going eventually. Um, so uh, what we're going to talk about Libre Silicon in general, what is it, um, why is it important, and how is it possible. Um, until recently it really wasn't, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And then uh, we'll talk about the role in um, in IoT. And IoT is a big space, but it doesn't necessarily require the latest technologies. It's, it kind of makes sense uh, where we're at now. Um, then I'll talk about Pi5, which is a um, the Libre Silicon project that I've been working on with the community for two some odd years. Um, and talk about where we're at, um, uh, what we're going, uh, what we're uh, shooting for, and you know how to contribute. And um, then I'll I'll skip over to the ICE five uh, wireless if we have time. And this one is uh, a, a like a small um, combination. PCB, which uses um, Lattice ICE 40 FPGA in combination with ECB5, or not ECB5, um, oh, um, the uh, ESP32. Yeah, my brain just went for a second there. But the ESP32 is the wireless component, and we'll talk a little bit about that and uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, so, uh, for like kind of anybody that couldn't really figure it out, uh, Libre Silicon is like, you know, the final form of open hardware in, in that the, the entirety of its, the chip contents are actually available and inspectable and reusable. So, um, if you have the, the, the Libre Silicon design that means that anybody could take that and go to the fab that you designed that chip for and create new ones and make variations and all the good stuff that comes along with open hardware um this wasn't really possible all the way down to the silicon until very recently um a lot of things happened in the fbj space and cores and processors were all designed in RTL and then targeted towards FPGAs. But more recently, someone being uh, Google, uh, uh, Skywater um, Boundaries and eFabless worked together to create an open PDK. And what happened with that is it, it, it allow somebody to have the, the standard cell design for a specific process that's actually fa uh, fabricatable. So usually you have to sign an NDA and then you have to go on and uh, download some super secret PDK. And it you can't really share the design afterwards because it has all this all these pieces that are you know proprietary. So um, people worked along with you know, grants and other various, you know, entities put in money to build up tools and eventually release a, a, a PDK that is actually manufacturable. And the first one of its kind was the Sky uh, 130 PDK. And um, I guess what, one, you're wondering why this is important and it's pretty easy sell for an open hardware conference. Uh, especially one space on Linux. Um, 
why it's important. Um, you're able to really reuse design um, and share freely your design. Um, you could previously share the RTL, RTL being the high level specification, and that's usually Verilog or VHDL or higher level abstractions like Chisel, um, Spinal HDL. This is all shareable, but the actual, the core, the inside of the chip, you really couldn't share, not freely without breaking NDA. So um, it, 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 this further allows people to uh, in, like inspect your design and it just, it just wasn't possible until more recently. And I'll talk a little bit about you know, how they made that possible in the upcoming slides. I, um, so this is like the, the overnight success that, that happened over the course of many years. And so many contributors were involved in the process that it's hard to kind of list them all. Um, but like, if you want to learn a bit more about, uh, Libre Silicon or Free Silicon, um, FOSSI is a good source, and the FSI uh, Silicon Conference is also a good one. Um, there's plenty of other places you can learn about it, um, but they have some good pointers from there. So, how how did they how did they do this? Um, so, it it came about. In about 2019, um, Google was like dead set on on opening up the process, making chips accessible to the world, and they uh, forged a partnership with um, Skywater Foundry uh, and Efabulous to open up that process. So the um, at the time, there was a uh, this new thing, the open lane flow, and it was it was funded by DARPA, I believe, and it allowed people to create uh, you know designs from RTL to digital layout or physical chips in like 24 hours. It's, it's kind of like the thing that they were going for, and it it's essentially an open source version of the old fashioned synthesis um, flow. So once they had that piece, you could make chips, but you couldn't really share them um, because the PDKs were still proprietary. So they, the team at Google worked with, uh, I think it was Oklahoma State, and other people to create a PDK that leverages the uh, the Skywater Foundry, and of course the Foundry was involved, and they they created a standard cell library and uh, various macros, and there there's a lot involved, and it happened kind of a little bit behind the scenes before it was released, and then um, when they finally announced the the uh shuttle which was even further they they said hey we'll we'll make these chips for you for free if you open source the design encouraging collaborators and and, and people to pull, come in and make their own design so um there are a lot of pieces that are involved in this process um and the, the important pieces came together with this flow and for the first time you were able to make an open hardware or Libre silicon design. Um, the Fabulous shuttle program, uh, I have some links down here that you can, you can check out um, the various pieces. Uh, there are uh, very important pieces that came along. I mean, uh, Efabulous's shuttle is kind of like the, the, the Kind of the carrier for everything and um, the original um, VLSI open um, source program magic 
was used and magic was created many years ago um it typically targeted like um an academic pdk which meant you could design chips but you really couldn't fabricate them afterwards um you could put uh pdks into the back end but they weren't free um, so you could actually make chips with magic before this uh, but it's really kind of the the chip layout it's like he had for uh, chips and uh, open road is is the, the kind of like the synthesis approach um, to go from your bear log specification to an actual uh, GDS, which is the kind of the manufacturing files for chips. Um, so open open a road has a, a fork called open lane that specifically targets the Sky 140, and it has the the standard cells for that process that were released to the public, and then you know the, the front end is uh, uses um, Yosis, which was work that was originally done by Claire Wolf of uh, Yosis HQ. And that was initially targeting FPGAs and uh, the uh, bitstream documentation and all that good stuff uh, that happened um, isn't really leveraged, but the, the front end, the, the, the synthesis and um, it also uses ABC from Alan Machinko, uh, which is really old. <laughs> it's been around forever, and it, it's kind of the core of, of synthesis flows. Uh, and it, it takes the takes the designs and maps them to some technology. Um, either way, there's there's a lot of pieces to the flow, and you can't really get into a huge amount of detail for each one, but um, we're able to take a Verilog file and create a chip from it, and that's the magic. And there's, a, there's you know, a lot of pieces that went into this thing, and I can kind of show you that with the project that we did. And, um, yeah, so um, what is the role in, in um, IoT? Well, these... These um, trailing edge nodes are older uh, boundaries. Um, they they aren't going to be making your you know your flagship SOCs that go out on your cellular phone, uh, but they are they are definitely capable of making microcontrollers and anything in you know that space. Um, so and 130 is particularly good for analog circuitry. Um, the Skywater Foundry used to be I think, Cyprus, um, so it's it's got it's plenty capable of, of creating a, a IoT device, and they're probably going to be the first type of hardware that's going to leverage this type of uh, um, flow. And Risk Five is going to be there along with it because it is open. Um, ISA architecture, so you don't have to pay any royalties for that. Along with the free shuttle, you can't really lose that if you're not paying anything. So I had to try. Of course, turns out it's it's a lot more work than um, initially expected, especially to make a full SOC. So our, our goal was to make a, a, a risk five microcontroller that has the ability to run CircuitPython mainly to get the specs that would be required for that, which is um, USB. And um, also uh, you need a, a timer interrupts or um, further actual constructs to actually support CircuitPython beyond MicroPython. MicroPython can run on practically anything. Uh, we got it running on the low five microcontroller, which was the based on the 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 sci five chip and it has very little RAM and it doesn't have a lot of the like fancy features. Um, but it 
definitely doesn't have USB, and that's what we're looking to contribute. And that was the first thing that we taped out, along with some other simple peripherals. Um, the overall goal of the project really hasn't been met yet, um, but the tape out of the USB core actually did happen on the first uh, shuttle. So um, it was just the tape out of the USB core and a couple of uh, simple um, simple cores like UART, and there was a like a, a video core, uh, core and a, a PDM, uh, which is a pulse density modulated output, so you can make analog output. And uh, the funny thing is we really were only concerned about the, the USB core, but it turned out the only thing we can get to work were the kind of the core, the filler cores. <laughs> um, and you can learn about the project with the links down here. And once we found out like the MPW1 had some whole time violations, it was kind of a, a sad thing. And um, we thought, hey, there's very little chance we're gonna get these chips working. And, uh, but we pushed on anyways, and my group actually developed a, uh, like a post-mortem carrier which was a, something that allowed people to bring their chips designs up, sort of. So there was an uh, uh, icebreaker FPGA that was plugged into this board that would control the voltages to the core and allowed you to, to tweak the voltages until you had closure on the timing. And there's a video on this um, if you wanted to take a look where TNT, which is the main contributor, uh, actually brought up the chips and actually demonstrated the RISC-V core and everything running. Um, so in the, when we were waiting for the chips, we also developed a, a CircuitPython port for an ESP5 version of the chip. Um, it had uh, PSRAM working and it was the kind of the, uh, one of the big things that we needed to be productive in Circuit Python is memory, and you really can't put a ton of memory in these. Um, so we wanted to bolt on into PSRM core, and uh, it, would, it became the heap of the, the implementation. Um, so the, yeah, this was actually uh, designed by Greg Davil, uh, pretty famous uh, Australian developer, and um, he was just kind of like, hey, could you do this for us when he was doing his advent of uh, hardware design? And then we took and ported CircuitPython to that. And, you know, things kind of slowed since then because there's been a lot of hiccups with the, the, uh, the, the shuttle and we're just trying to get everything in place before we contribute again. Um, so it's openly developed on GitHub and my uh, Discord server. If anybody wants to get involved, there's a link for that. And also the Pi5 ASIC, uh, uh, we launched a, a simple funding initiative to try to help pay for the, the developers. Because this is not, it's not like everyday work. It's actually like a job after a while, because there's, there's a lot involved. So I wanted to make sure that people weren't, you know, losing time. Um, but and you can support that um, through that as well as going into the the Caravel slash uh, Open Silicon um, community and you know contributing more directly. Uh, and there's a there's a, a Slack for that. And of course, you can follow people like Matt Ben on Twitter. And you see the latest. And he is, he's proprietor of a, a Zero to ASIC um, course, and Tiny Tape Out is the new cool for MPW7. So there's been a lot of sh uh, people showing off there. And it's really neat to see the, the uh, software developers and people creating new things that you know weren't really possible in, in the not too near past or um so that um since we do have very little time i can talk about 
Um, it's fine. Michael, uh, yeah. I think okay. he's done for this lunch. So you're free to just go over by 10 minutes. Don't worry about it. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah, this, um, yeah. OK, so ICE 5 was uh, a collaboration that I did with Eric Brombo. And it, it is a, a simple um, combination of the ICE, the ICE 40 uh, up 5K FPGA and the ESP32 C3. Um, the ICE 5 uh, kind of tells you the that it's using the ICE 5 or ICE 40 FPGA, and also that it's got risk 5 somewhere in there. And um, the expressive ESP32 C3 is the, their first um, risk 5 offering, and expressive actually moved towards using risk 5 for all the designs. Um, um, we learned a little bit about you know the kind of limitations of this um, chip is it's a lot less powerful than their previous um, ESP32 designs, but then again, it's more than enough for programming the FPGA uh, wirelessly. And um, it, yeah, it's it's plenty good for that. It's not it's not going to stream super fast to the device. Uh, there's not a lot of peripheral I/O. I mean, adding that that FPGA really makes a more productive actually implementation. Um, so the, there's the expressive IDF or their their SDK, and then uh, for the FPGA side, we use the Yosis HQ open source toolchain, and that allows us to develop uh, IP for the the FPGA with completely open flow, which is very nice. And then we have you know, design is in KiCad and everything is it's out there in the world for everyone to see. Um, it was completely transparent the whole time. And yeah, it's, uh, it was actually one of my like more recent um, developments. So um, there's some links down there for those uh, things. Uh, we've actually crowdfunded this guy um, on group kits and uh, you can't really uh, buy them anymore. Um, the campaign closed, but there will be some available uh, beyond the ones that were backed for the campaign shortly after the campaign is fulfilled, which is happening soon. They're actually in manufacture right now. And um, yeah. I have a prototype uh, I can show later on if anyone's interested to take a look. Uh, sorry. Yeah. The, um, I, sent, I sent Chris one of the, one of the prototype um, boards because he was actually doing the, the support for uh, Zephyr, which is a really nice addition. And it, it really kind of rounds off the support for the board. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of people working on firmware. Um, uh, Eric himself, he put in a lot of time with the bare metal slash um, MicroPython support. Uh, and he also provided Arduino support uh, for the the ESP32. Um, I, I actually brought up Rust on the board, uh, which was relatively straightforward because there's somebody that did a port for it. Um, and um, for Zephyr, we actually have Zephyr support for both the ICE40 and the ESP32, if I'm not mistaken. So there's going to be a, like a soft core that will be thrown in here. And then you can run Zephyr on both cores. Um, it's really not necessary to do that, but it's also nice to have that option. So you have a soft core that can drive the, the, the PMODs in a productive way. Um, so PMODs are the actual I, uh, outputs of the FPGA are here. Uh, there's a few spare IOs for the ESP32 over here. And, and then they're interconnected to pro so I could say yeah, I can run a script that actually programs the FPGA wirelessly. And it's kind of like the, the cool uh, factor or whatever. So there's been work, a lot of work on the firmware on the, on the SP32. And I'm, I've been doing a little bit of uh, working on trying to make more demos for the FPGA. Uh, I got the, like the Nintendo uh, NES running on this. 
um, more recently, but there's, uh, I, I want to do a, a Doom port so they can, you know, actually, you know, do something cool like that. Um, we have a PS RAM on here that we can load up with various things and use that to, you know, drive the core and any cores that are inside of this uh, FPGA, et cetera. So yeah, it's, 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 um, it's a work in um, more uh, finished um, work in progress. The software is really in the, uh, the gate where are kind of where the contributions can still happen. And um, I definitely, it's all community based. So come on down essentially. Uh, uh, we have the open uh, GitHub uh, repository, which has a, a group of uh, repositories, uh, my Discord channel, and of course there's my Twitter. But yeah, if you want to if you want to collaborate, it's probably best to to use the GitHub and Discord, and then just kind of show off on Twitter. <laughs> it's kind of how I do it. So that's kind of like the rundown of Ice Five uh, Wireless and. Um, it, it'll allow people to kind of design new IP for the FPGA relatively quickly uh, and, and enable like wireless apps for FPGAs that really weren't a thing in the past. Um, so yeah, and that pretty much does it for my slides. Um, which will leave about, would have left about three minutes for questions at the end. Um, so, if anybody has anything they want to ask or contribute, that'd be nice. Hello. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm from England. I'm from Taiwan. Actually, I'm secretly uh, admired your work for a long time. <laughs> and uh, I'm have, I have three quick quick questions. The yeah. first is uh, how is the MPW7 status? And the second one is uh, will you is there any kind of roadmap that you can break down to be kind of a SLC, a GSLC event so uh, people from around the world could join you? And the third one is that, uh, uh, as far as uh, if my memory serves me right, that uh, uh, there is some kind of the ice 40 Linux uh, uh, provided by uh, TNT. Is it possible to run the uh, Pi 5 configuration in the future? Yeah, okay. So um sure the so the mpw7 uh, just actually is about to be um uh, i think the the submission deadline is the 18th so it's about to close um our our pi 5 design is probably not going to have a submission there because we just didn't have the, the we couldn't get together the funding slash uh resources to uh pull together to submit for seven so we're probably going to push it out but mpw7 was kind of an interesting shuttle in that it, um it was the first um shuttle that had the tiny tape out which was um you know it was a, a way to allow like very new developers to design circuits uh with the graphical interface and actually have their chips fabricated alongside a bunch of other people. Um, and it's going to bring in, you know, people that weren't able to contribute in the past. It's like, you don't have to set up the tools. You don't have to do anything ma like magical to get it to work. You just send either like a design or a bear log and then uh, it used uh, GitHub actions and magic in the background to pull the design to GDS level. And then it would be integrated uh, behind the scenes so that the people that are working on it don't really have to know about that. Of course, they need to know a little bit because the scan chain that's used to feed all the designs and all this other stuff um, is really, it's not going to be completely transparent. But yeah, so like our, our design, uh, we're just, we, we spent a lot of time waiting for the, for the, uh, for the RAM support. Open RAM was the, um, Kind of the, the generator for RAMs, um, and it hadn't really been available beyond the, like one block. And we used that one block in our first 
um, application and there's there was some work in characterizing the the rams and making sure that they worked but there isn't a whole lot of like um variations and and we needed a bunch of different types of rams for a microcontroller um for the caches and you know the the main ram and buffers and what have you so um we wanted the support to be there before we so we can explore the space and find the right RAM sizes. So um, we, we're, we're still kind of waiting on the results for that. Um, those have been taped out. It just, not all of them have been verified. Um, yeah, and it, it's really hard to find time to do this. I mean, making a chip in your spare time, I found that wasn't really that easy. Um, if I didn't have TNT, um, I wouldn't have been able to do what, what I'd done so far. I mean, he pretty much did the majority of the, the actual work on the project. I appreciate that greatly. And um, he's, his new developments really help the whole community. And I, I just kind of facilitated and made and too long, didn't read kind of things. And I just made sure that everybody was kind of, like happy <laughs> so yeah mpw7 it, uh, we're probably going to push until M mpw8 uh which is sad but and then again it's yeah um, these things aren't happening lightning fast you you send out for a shuttle and you wait almost a year before you get chips anyways um so it's good to see those other designs on the previous shuttles come through and they can show people like like there was on MPW2, which was the one that just recently got um, shipped to the in a second shuttle um, participants. Uh, that actually had some further timing uh, hold issues on the I, on the IOs. Um, so there's there's some work on trying to figure out how to make something productive of that, and then roll in what's necessary to, to eliminate those those violations um, in the future shuttles. Um, and it was for the first like first holding hold time violations in the in the actual core, um, which is I guess I could show you. Um, Michael, I was just gonna mention, so I think you brought this up at the beginning of the talk. This is Chris, by the way. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but uh, really, there are so many parties involved in making this whole, both of these projects hugely successful. Yeah. Um, but the first one is obviously like what a lot of people refer to as the commoditization of the open, of the synthesis tool chain for FPGAs, which is, I mean, Claire Wolf, uh, Yosis Next PNR, and uh, of course, like F4 PGA. But then uh, Skywater 130 is just, it's like a godsend because. I remember 20 years ago, it was prohibitively expensive for a starving right. student getting to university, you know, and so it's just incredible. Uh, I think we're a little bit over time, so maybe we'll do one more question and wrap it up. But uh, okay. I just wanted to personally say thanks. So this, yeah. this is, the, I mean, to everybody involved in TNT, Eric, uh, Greg, everybody, this has been pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, the big the big players are, are Claire Wolf, uh, Tim Edwards, um, uh, Tim uh, Ansel, um, uh, Mohammed Kasim, um, Alam, uh, Mohammed Chong. There's a lot of people involved, though. is 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 a huge coordinated effort, and it would have been possible without all that collaboration. So, like this this piece down here in the is the is the, actually the core that the risk five core that the whole shuttle is actually given. And then our design goes in this little section on the top there. Um, so this RISC-V core, the initial implementation was based on the Pico RISC-V. And that, that actually went through on the first shuttle. And then they switched over to VEX uh, in the same area for subsequent shuttles. Uh, but that gives you a, like a, a RISC-V foundation for you know driving uh, and analyzing the design that you put into this space. They have variations of this uh, carrier for analog. So if you want analog pins, they just strip back all the all the 
niceties of the pads so that you can have you know more bandwidth uh less restrictions on those pins um there's been a lot of work some really cool work that i saw recently that is very relevant was there was somebody that created a five gigahertz um transceiver and there's a risk five driving that i forget what was the name of the project but that that i saw on twitter recently and what when it, asking about um linux there are actually uh, a few designs that set out to do that as well uh, pi 5 isn't really wasn't thinking that but if we if we enable certain features in the best vex core we could definitely run linux on the the ice 40 shuttle okay uh just a quick uh does anyone have any last questions like a short one or Okay, well, in that case, uh, let's have a round of applause for, for Michael and everyone involved. <laughs>